Hello, everybody, and welcome to Science Division Live. It is April 20, April 30th now, uh, and we are so glad you're joining us for another installment of Science Division Live. And today we're talking about yuck. How can you eat that? Uh, and we are so excited to be joined by Tiffany from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and she's going to talk to you guys all about some fun food facts and give us a little presentation about what she does at the museum. So Tiffany, go ahead and take it away. Tell us what you're going to talk about today, who you are, and give us your presentation. Thank you, Alyssa. Uh, my name is Tiffany Nestle, and I'm the research manager of the Genetics Lab. And we are one of two labs that are visible to the public any day that the museum is open. And I'm going to um, start sharing my screen in just a second so that you can get a picture of our lab. And let's see. Okay, from the beginning. Okay, am I back in the Zoom call? And okay. Is it going? There we go. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I've been practicing this all the time, but uh, never actually via Zoom. So let's see how it goes. Um, well, for the last 10 years, the genetics lab has been studying how people perceive the different tastes. And I know that compared to some of the topics that you've gotten to hear about on here, taste seems kind of not glamorous. I mean, it's really hard to compare with um, mass extinctions and cannibalism and the discovery of new fossils. But it's the fact that taste is so ordinary that actually makes it really interesting to study. We all use our sense of taste every day, and we all perceive taste just a little bit differently. And these differences can lead us to really inane but fun conversations about preferences because we all have strong opinions about the right way to do something. So for example, do you prefer Miracle Whip or mayonnaise? Uh, do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? And should guacamole to you, is it something that should be smooth or is it something that should be chunky? So while we all have these preferences, we don't often think about the fact that our genes may play a role in both how we detect these foods and how much we like them. One example of this is we had a family come in and uh, taste some sour solutions in our lab. And the kid who was designated the picky eater tried the sour solution and only perceived sour, really didn't find it pleasant. They were a great sport, but they kind of hate it. Um, now his mom and his sister though, they perceived both sour and sweet. So it was kind of an eye-opening experience for them that one of the children was actually detecting the food differently than the rest of the family. And it gave them words to talk about this. And this difference between the child and the rest of the family may have been due to a variation in, um, in their genes. So we have 35 genes that are known to help us detect taste. And just to be clear, Every single person has every one of these genes. It's just little variations within them that make us taste some things more strongly, some things maybe a little bit mildly, and in a couple of cases, not taste anything at all. So it turns out that the number one reason we give for choosing certain food is the way that it tastes. And so today I wanna to talk a little bit about the difference of taste and flavor the five tastes, and then how animals taste differently or perceive tastes differently from people. We all know they don't. That was the candidate. Um, so uh, when we talk about taste in everyday language, uh, when we're out with our friends, we're talking about more than just the sense of taste, which is limited to what our tongue can detect apart from the other senses. So that's salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami. Flavor, um, it, that's how I'm going to refer to this concept that uses all of our senses to create a perception of food. The flavor is going to incorporate the sense of taste, but also what your food looks like, what it smells like, how it feels, and even what it sounds like. So let's dive into each one of those things. Uh, one study found that people who wore noise canceling headphones couldn't detect um, or they didn't perceive potato chips as being as fresh as people who weren't wearing the canceling headphones because they couldn't hear that telltale crunch. 
And the same is true if you think about cooking uh, celery or asparagus. When you're preparing them um, and you try and snap it, if you don't hear that nice crack, you throw it away without even tasting it because you assume it's not fresh. Um, if we go to your sense of touch, right now we're gonna um, discuss the way that the food feels in your mouth because there are a lot of foods that we will not eat again because of the way that it feels in our mouths. So some main culprits here are avocados and bananas, uh, cottage cheese, tomatoes, and grapes. And um, we're gonna talk about another part of touch in a little while. One of the others is the way that food looks. Um, so if you guys have been binge watching any of the shows right now, you hear um, any cooking shows, you hear them all the time talk about how important um, presentation is on the food. And it's really because we give a lot of weight to what food looks like. And it can, we allow it to mess with us. So they've done numerous studies where they took lemon lime sodas and they put food coloring in so that it would look like um, a fruit punch or an orange soda or a grape soda. And even though everybody got lemon lime, most of the time people would attribute the taste to what uh, to match the color of the drink that they had. The same thing has also been done with yogurts and wine. Um, so they'll take a white wine, put red food coloring in it, give it that nice, um, nice red color. And even some trained sommeliers will think of it as um, being a red wine and give it red wine attributes. Um, so the person who is most known for messing with what food looks like might be Alfred Hitchcock. He threw uh, that famous blue dinner party. And if you're not familiar with it, he made everything blue. There was blue uh, chicken and fish, blue rolls, blue um, peaches, blue butter, and it wasn't just the food that was blue, everything was blue. So the tablecloth, the plates, um, the silverware, the decorations, everything was blue. And turns out blue is not the color we really like to see in food. It is disconcerting because it's not something we see in nature. And it's actually been shown to be an appetite suppressant. And so we eat less when things are blue. So for example, Alyssa, how do these eggs look to you? Those look awful. I would not <laughs> eat those. <laughs> and some people will try it, but your initial reaction is really terrible, um, even though you know it's just blue food coloring. And we are so wary of food that doesn't look right, that an entire kid's book was written about it. Uh, who doesn't love Dr. Seuss's beloved green eggs and ham? where Sam I am will not eat the food because it's green. And when he finally overcomes it, turns out it tastes okay, but that is really alarming to him for quite a while. Now, I wanna um, lead you through an activity that you can actually do at home to really dive into the difference between taste and flavor. So I'm gonna put the instructions up on the next screen and you'll be able to take a screenshot and next time you have to go to the store, just get some flavored jelly beans and that's all you need. So uh, for these flavored jelly beans, the important thing to know is that uh, you want the ones where every single one will have a different flavor to it. You don't want the ones that just look different color-wise but have the same taste. So all you have to do is have somebody close their eyes, put up their hand, and then you put a jelly bean in it, and you have them pinch their nose. And at this point, don't give them cinnamon. But with their nose plugged, um, have them chew on it and see what they can tell. Um, ask them if they can figure out what flavor they have. And they might make a good guess and you'll know. But ask them also if they can taste anything. Can they tell it's sour or can they tell it's sweet? Because that's your sense of taste. That's what your tongue can tell apart from the other senses. And then have them unplug their nose. And you should see this moment where their eyes get like really big. Um, as they detect the flavor, because you may have been really nice and given them cherry, or you could have been kind of mean and given them licorice. And when their mouth was, or their nose was plugged, they should have perceived them the same way. And the other um, thing you might be wondering right now is why did I say not to give cinnamon? Not just because I don't care for the cinnamon ones, although that's true. So cinnamon has something called cinnamaldehyde in it which is similar to the capsaicin found in peppers. 
it's a spice. And spicy isn't actually a taste, it's a flavor. Spicy is considered a theme. And that's why when you accidentally cut a pepper and then touch your eye, you really, really regret your life choices. Um, well, the same thing is happening on your tongue. That irritation is um, sending uh, signals to your brain, but not in the same way that it would for taste. So once you've tried it with the other jelly beans, go ahead and throw cinnamon into the mix and you'll see what I'm talking about. The other thing that I really like about this experiment is it shows the two different ways that we smell things. So we have both orthonasal smell and retronasal smell. And the fancy word that we use for that is called olfaction. So just in case I say either one, um, you'll know what, they, what I mean. When we, think of ortho, uh, when we think of smelling, orthonasal smell is what we are typically thinking of. This is when the stimulus is outside of our body, like sniffing a rose or a jelly bean, um, and we detect it during inhalation. We actually breathe it in, goes through our nose, and binds to the odor receptors. However, if you had just sniffed that jelly bean, you still may not have been able to detect the flavor. And that's because we have um, the waxy coating around the candy. And it's not until you break that open that more odor molecules are um, set free. And the same thing happens with herbs and spices when you're cooking. That's why you have to always chop the mint or the cilantro or anything, um, because otherwise you haven't really released the full um, component. And where we normally do that is in our mouth as we're chewing food. That's where we break it open and um, let those odor molecules out. So retronasal smell is when something's been in your mouth and it actually happens during exhalation. So when you've been chewing and you breathe out, the odor molecules go up the side of your mouth um, and through your nasal passages and bind to your odor receptors. That. When they talk about um, when you hear people say that taste is mostly smell, it's usually the retronasal smell that they're talking about. Um, most of the time, these two smells are harmonious and they agree with each other. But every once in a while, there can be a discord. And so a great example of that is durian. Uh, durian fruit is, well, to put it nicely, um, for the orthonasal smell, a lot of times people smell dirty sweat socks. Um, but once they put it in their mouth, it can actually have a pleasant aroma. And if you have not had the chance to try durian fruit before, when we are up and running again, come check out our Curiosity Cruiser um, because we have durian as a, um, an activity plus many other tastes. So another example of there being a little bit of a discord is cilantro. So Alyssa, if you'll unmute for a second, I just wanna ask a couple questions about cilantro. Okay. Man. Are you a fan? Am I a fan? I am not a super fan of cilantro. I definitely don't keep it in my pantry, but I will eat it if it's in salt. Okay. And when you say you're not a huge fan, I, my question is, does it taste like one of these three things? Soap or dirt? It or definitely tastes earthy like dirt to me. Okay. Um, well, the most common complaint that we see is that it has kind of that soapy taste. And the reason why is that some people have a variation in their smell genes and um, it's in their lysis receptors or the soap receptor. And that variation changes the shape of the receptor just enough that the cilantro odor molecule will actually bind to it, excite that molecule and send a signal to the brain saying, hey, you're having soap. Um, whereas most people, uh, the variation that they have of the gene, the receptor is different shaped, cilantro goes by, can't bind to it, just kind of goes on and you don't see the soap. Uh, so strictly speaking, cilantro is really more of a smell issue than it is a taste issue. Uh, the way that we actually taste is through our taste buds. And if you stick out your tongue, and uh, especially if you're with people right now, stick them out of each other, and you'll see little bumps on the tongue. Those are called papillae, and they house the taste buds. And on average, we have 10,000 taste buds on our tongue. That seems like a whole lot until you start comparing us to some other animals. So 
Herbivores have significantly more than we do. A rabbit has about 17,000 and a cow has about 25,000. Now, if you have any guesses for what tops the chart, I can tell you I was absolutely surprised. Alyssa, do you have any guesses? My guess would be uh, a herbivore who eats the most herbs, like an elephant. That would be a great guess. Um, but you're actually not even, um, not even close. No. Um, so you actually would have to take to the ocean. Um, the one with the most taste, um, taste buds is actually a catfish. They can have between 100 and 175,000 taste buds. And they're not even limited to the mouth. So those little whiskers that you see, uh, they can be, um, they're littered with taste receptors. And so I don't honestly know how all of it works yet because I'm newer to studying um, taste in animals, but they can actually taste their prey in the water um, using a sensing thing with their um, taste receptors and they know exactly where it is and where to go. Really cool, but I don't know a lot about it yet. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have carnivores. They really only have about 500 uh, papillae, or I'm sorry, taste buds uh, on their tongue because they only eat meat. So they don't to detect everything. And birds have even less with chickens coming in, um, the lowest at about 50. Now, there is one animal that doesn't have any taste buds, but it's not really a true comparison on here, and that's the snake. So snakes don't have any taste buds, but they use a whole different mechanism for tasting called a Jacobson's organ. So now that we've gotten to talk through a lot on taste buds, let's jump to the actual taste. Sweet. This one tends to be everybody's favorite. It's the taste of carbohydrates and it gives us quick energy. But we might love sweet a little bit too much. So, one study looked at um, what is the ideal amount of sugar that somebody wants to have. And for kids, oh my goodness, um, it's taking eight out glass of water and adding 12 teaspoons of sugar to it. That is about twice as concentrated as a can of soda. And um, that's their ideal. And our need for sweet does go down as we get older, but not as much as you might hope. Uh, for an adult, it's uh, the same water plus seven teaspoons of sugar. Um, now, there are some animals that no longer taste sweet because they're carnivorous and they don't need to be able to detect food. They're not eating any fruit. So some of those are um, the cats, so like lions and tigers, hyenas, and then dolphins and whales. And dolphins and whales turn out to be pretty fascinating because the only taste that they can detect is salt. They've lost the ability to detect anything else. And so therefore, salty is the only taste that every mammal can detect. And for people, Salty is concentration uh, dependent, and it's actually the least studied of the tastes that, um, that we know about. So there are genes that we haven't yet probably discovered, and maybe even mechanisms for salt perception that we haven't figured out. And the other taste that has a lot more work that needs to be done is sour. Sour is the taste of acidity, and it's found in lemons and limes, all your citrus fruits, um, and anything pickled, um, because those are pickled in vinegar, which is acetic acid and one of the sours. Sour alerts us both to vitamin C and warns us against toxins um, like spoiled meat and unripe fruit. And uh, it's very concentration dependent on if we like it. Now, most animals can detect sour. A penguin, it's the only thing besides salty that they can detect. They're, they're up to two tastes. And the only animal I know of who can't taste sour at all is the fruit fly. And that's probably why they're associated with e eating uh, sour or sweet foods. Um, I'm going to leave this picture up for a second because the next taste I'm going to talk about is bitter. And those two often get confused. So just to reiterate, sour is the taste of citrus fruits and vinegar and any acid. Bitter is the taste that's found in 
dark chocolates and black coffee, cruciferous vegetables, and coffee beers like an ice. Bitter is by far the most studied of the tastes, and it is one thing that we innately dislike. So the second we're born, we cannot stand bitter. And it makes sense because uh, carnivores have to be able to taste bitter so as not to eat rotten meat. And herbivores need it, so as Alyssa mentioned earlier, not to eat toxic plants. And so everybody needs to taste bitter for survival, except for the dolphin and the uh, whale because they're eating their food and fresh. Um, so because we don't eat poisonous plants regularly, thankfully, we can actually overcome our aversion to bitter. And so for example, I hate black coffee, it is so gross. But I like a caffeine pick-me-up, and so I'm willing to overcome my hatred of the bitterness to have it. Now, I also mask it with a lot of cream and sugar, which really helps. Um, but there are ways to overcome. Um, there are actually some bitter compounds that a couple people can't taste, and that's called PTC, or its cousin is Coke. And uh, about a quarter of people cannot taste it. Some taste it mildly bitterly, and some it is so disgustingly bitter, it is just awful. Um, but there's a couple misperceptions about PTC that I just want to uh, talk through. And that is that many people think if they can't taste PTC, they can't taste bitter at all. And that's not true. As I said before, we've got 25 genes that help us detect bitter. And PTC is only affected by one of them. That's called Taster 38. And so by variations within that gene can make you taste it or not taste it. However, I can't taste PTC and I said black coffee is really bitter. And that's because it's affected by some of the other genes. So Taster 43 is known for coffee preference. Um, I find stevia really bitter, where some people find it sweet, and some people can actually taste both sweetness and bitterness. And that tends to be a response to a gene called taste of four. Uh, so, last taste is umami. And this one, people are less familiar with umami. It was discovered in 1908 in Japan by a scientist named Kikuna Ikeda. But it's only more recently been accepted as a taste and become a term we know of more in America. We are far more familiar with the term savory, and we associate it with um, fish, meats, aged cheeses, and hearty vegetables like tomatoes and mushrooms. And if uh, umami translates from Japanese into English as deliciousness, and if you think about a lot of your favorite comfort foods, most of those are going to be umami-rich dishes. Um, what's kind of interesting is, though it's called delicious, most people actually find it fairly unpleasant when it's in isolation, but it's known to bring out the other flavors and dishes and make other dishes taste uh, better than they would have. And the two animals who can't detect umami are the cute little panda bear. Um, so because pandas are uh, on a bamboo diet, they have lost the ability to taste umami. And the other is a vampire bat, which unfortunately I couldn't find much. So I don't. Um, other uh, animals can detect taste that we can't. So some rodents can detect starches and some cats can, um, maybe all cats can detect adenosine triphosphate, which is a molecule found in every living cell. But for right now for people, as far as we know, it's just those five. Um, but work is being done to see if there's others. So our lab looked at fatty acids and found people could tell um, differences in concentration by just using their sense of taste, but uh, we haven't yet figured out what gene is responsible. And some other labs are looking at things like uh, calcium and carbonation, water, and the metallic taste that you might get with some medicines or putting pennies in your mouth, which don't do. Um, and so who knows, in 10, 20 years, we might be talking about the seven basic tastes. And the last thing before we jump to questions that I'd love to talk about is the tongue mat. 
Um, most people are familiar with this tongue map. It's the idea that you can only taste in certain areas of the tongue. And it's, um, so what happened with this was, it was a mistranslation of a German paper. Uh, this scientist found that people were more sensitive in certain areas to the different tastes. But when it was translated, it went from being taste and no taste to, or I mean, sensitive and less sensitive to taste and no taste. And that's how the myth of the tongue map was born. But if you ever sucked on a lollipop, uh, you put it in the center of your tongue and you can detect that it's sweet, even though it's not right up at the tip. So thank you for listening to me talk a lot about taste and food today. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. That was excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop your sharing for just a minute and we'll go to side by side. We do have some questions uh, in our Facebook chat. So thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, one of the biggest questions, and I had this question too, I've been spending a lot of time with my cat. Uh, and we're, uh, Courtney and I are wondering, how do we know what animals taste? Have you studied their genes? And can you relate their genes and your study of human genes? each other a little bit. Uh, so that's great. Uh, yes, many times there is gene work that is done. And um, that's one of the steps. There's also just pure preference where they give pets um, bowls with uh, water with no sugar in it versus water with sugar in it or um, a stimulus like that. And they see, do they gravitate towards one bowl more than the other? And in the case of cats, there's no difference between them. Um, so there can be a lot of different ways we do it, but we uh, start with kind of observing, and then we also um, do some gene work. And sometimes the genes are the same for animals, and sometimes they're different. That's great. Thank you. One other question. Dave just wrote in, if people taste soap when they eat cilantro, would they have the same reaction if they pinched their nose, since you said it's mostly smell? So in theory, they shouldn't have it. When, so I'm not one of those people, so I can't speak um, like based on that. Um, but the answer at first would be no. They should be able to chew on it and not perceive it if their nose is pinched. However, you're only going to get so far chewing on food and trying to swallow with your nose pinched. So unfortunately, when you do unplug it, it's going to. I was really hoping that I could eat <laughs> Birdie Boss jelly beans, you know, with yes. nose pinched, and it would only be sweet. <laughs> yes. Well, and that goes back to the eyesight thing is uh, whenever we did that experiment, people were so freaked out that we were going to give them like those bamboozled jelly beans, be messing with the, um, the way that it looks and the taste. And people were so nervous until we assured them we weren't. That's excellent. And then I think to go along with that, are there any other like taste tripping experiences um, that you know of that people could do at home? Yeah, so um, there is something called miracle fruit. It is based on the fruit of a berry. Um, called um, with a chemical called miraculin in it. And um, it's a African fruit. And when you coat your tongue with it, it actually stops or what happens is when you have something sour, it makes you think you're also having something sweet. So it'll make a lemon taste like lemonade. Um, and then there are also some taste inhibitors. Um, like there's um, a tea called genomic. I never pronounce it correctly but like gymnemic acid or something. And um, it can cover your sweet receptors and make things taste really bad. Now, if you do this, please don't have the durian fruit because I made that, I did that combination. It's not wise. Learn from my mistake. <laughs> um, and then there is actually one, and um, I think it's called lactosol and it is an umami inhibitor. So yeah, those are all things that you could potentially access and do at home. That's great. Well, we are out of time for today, but thank you so much. This was a great presentation. Um, and I so enjoy getting to host these and seeing what the museum comes up with. And we are going to be doing this for our Facebook audience again tomorrow with a whole new scientist right here on Facebook Live at noon Mountain Time. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. And thank you all for joining us. This was great. Thanks. Tiffany. Thank you.